Mr. Sullivan. There you are. <laughs> Here I am. Yeah, we had a bit of a Cloudlandia uh, mix-up, which <laughs> Well, nevertheless, I'm excited about uh, here we are. Yeah, here we are. And uh, I'm in the cottage country. And uh, Dean, have you ever uh, had conversations with Americans about cottage country in Ontario and what how vast it is? I mean, that's, it's hard for a lot of people to grasp. It is. It's very different. Like, you know, here, of course, people have, uh, you know, beach houses and stuff like that. But it's mm-hmm. a different, it's a different experience than yeah. um, the cottage. Uh, you know, my first few cottage experiences were in, uh, with friends who had cottages that were boat access only. Which is a whole a different even experience. Mm-hmm. Than, yeah, we have um, uh, we uh, have two mm-hmm. two lakes just north of us where there's actually islands. Um, yeah, in the lake, never... and people's cottages ring. You know, they're on the, you know, they go right around the island. But in order to get to these cottages, you have to take a boat. You can't drive to uh, right. Any, you drive to a, you drive to a landing to a marina, and then there's boating over from. And that's just the regular thing, and they'll do this five, six, seven times uh, yeah, a year for you know for uh, uh, weekends or for uh, you know for longer stays. We're in eleven days. This this one with us right now. We're in eleven days. Uh huh. Um, yeah, and ours used to be an island, but they put a causeway in. I don't know, uh, twenty, twenty, thirty, maybe even longer, maybe about forty years ago. So there's actually a. Uh, a roadway across to an island that there's about uh, 15, 20 cottages, and we're one of them. Yeah. Well, there you go. And but how was your first week it, of uh, solitude? Been? It was great. It was great. And, um, you know, this is our third um, trip of the summer, mm-hmm. end of June, end of July, and now 11 days. So it'll be total about uh, just short of four weeks total. And uh, we've had, with the exception of two uh, intermittently rainy days, um, the rest of it's just been bright sun, sunshine. You know, it's just been superb weather. You know, and today well, it's about 75, 75, 76. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm using American code there. I'm talking. I like that. And, I yeah. like that. Did you ever switch over? Here's the question. Did you ever did you ever switch over? Like uh you know, well, even Dan, here's today, what I did. Here's what I did. Is I gave up on trying to convert because what I just decided was let's just like all I need to know is that the ideal temperature for me is outdoor temperature with sun twenty five degrees. And uh-huh. I would prefer I would prefer each degree less than that to be rather than more than that. So I would prefer it to be 15 over 35. And I know that somewhere in that range of, of 18 to 23 is the sweet spot for a guy like me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all, that's all I need to know. I don't need to convert anymore that's i think that's where everybody gets in in trouble is let's just adopt it <laughs> yeah well it's really it's really interesting because you know i was um i was actually here when they uh you know i had moved to canada in 1971 and i think uh it was right around then that they switched over to yeah um, that's what i'm saying this, like i remember I was in first grade when we made the switch to the metric system, as was everybody else, uh, you know, in my generation, right? Like my age and up, we were, we grew up with the switch to the metric, but everybody was trying to, they were teaching it and teaching it with conversions. So you're teaching something and that's about like they were teaching centimeters as they relate to inches and kilometers as yeah. they relate to miles per hour. And so everything was about this confusing learning to do the math of the conversion. You weren't even you weren't than, learning. You were learning uh, 
Esperanto, actually. You, you weren't, exactly. you weren't leaving. <laughs> you I, weren't I think that's yeah. absolutely true. I think that's uh, when you have a better superior, like when you look at it, the metric system is clearly easier and, and, um, completely understandable is let's just learn that, you know, why do we need to know that a meter is about three feet? Let's just l- learn what a meter is and then know yeah. that this is two meters, you know, it's like, so, um, why do we need to convert everything? I think that's, yeah. Well, you're, you're voicing probably an a opinion, lesson there. Uh, yeah, you're voicing an opinion, of course, of someone from a younger generation here because uh, mm-hmm. feet, uh, yeah, there's something fundamentally grounding uh, mainland. See, I, I think um, metric is a halfway house on the way between the mainland and Cloudlandia. I think you're yeah, right. It's, yeah, I think it's the, I think it's the, it's the language that the bartenders speak at the Star Trek Cafe, which is halfway between the mainland <laughs> and oh, <laughs> the I think they order drinks. They order drinks in metric, and uh, it doesn't really matter because everyone's going to get, you know, is going to get inebriated one way or the That's other. So, so it doesn't really matter whether it's a pint or it's a liter, you know. Yeah, uh, milliliter. But, but, but anyway, uh, back to the cottage country. So I was doing some. Uh, Google research, and um, uh, one thing that I already knew is that Canada as a country, so you're talking just one country on the planet, either contains or borders on half the fresh water in the world. Okay, so if you think of all the fresh water in the world, Canada as a country either contains, you know, so it has, um, you know, self-contained freshwater lakes, or it borders on, and that'd be the Great Lakes, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the Great Lakes with the United States. So that's half the freshwater uh, on the planet uh, with one country. But the province of Ontario, so for those who are not familiar with Canada, the, you know, these are the big, you know, we call them provinces. So there's 10 of them. And Ontario and Quebec are the two biggest ones. Um, and I think Quebec's a bit bigger than Ontario, but Ontario has 250,000, that's a quarter million freshwater lakes, and that's Mm -hmm. half the freshwater lakes on the planet. So this one province that we're in. Of course, most Canadians live within 100 miles of the U.S. border, so they don't really actually experience these lakes. Right. um, And, um, you know, it's left over from melting glaciers. I, I suspect that's where the, mm-hmm. the water, because uh, it's not salt water, it's fresh water. And, uh, yeah. And uh, it's quite spectacular how just how many lakes there are up here. I know northern Minnesota, northern, you know, like Wisconsin, that they have lakes and everything, but it's nothing to compare with the uh, just the proliferation of uh, lakes here in this and it's beautiful t- territory too it's called the canadian shield and it's the um right out front of our cottage we have a a, a slanting cliff granite all the it's granite a, and yeah total granite and it goes right down to, it's 40 feet you know from the the uh, where our we have sort of a patio up front and then it's a slanting 40 feet of granite that goes and it just keeps going down because it when it gets down to the bottom of the lake it's 200 feet down so it's just wow. this vast vast and i was reading about this rock uh and this is the oldest exposed rock in the world not not my, our particular rock but just this whole rock formation um uh, which is called the Canadian Shield, and it's so this rock has been exposed for four and a half million years. This is the oldest. The Himalayas are very, very young compared to this rock right here. So there you go. Mm. I mean, we're, I'm I'm just filling in. You know, it's a Sunday. The more you know, the more you know. I mean, uh, why do I know these things? This is the big question. Why? Because you are eternally. Did curious. you ever? Yes, I think that's. I, I think that's that's very very true. When did you discover that about yourself? This curious that I was curious. 
Nate, you are a curious person. I am, absolutely. I, am. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I've I often remember, said that. I've often said that. I, you know, I've heard people say that. You know, Dean Jackson's a very curious person. <laughs> yes. And I said, how do you mean that? I said, how you do you mean curious that? peculiar or curious inquisitive? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And yes to both is probably the right answer. Um, mm-hmm. I remember one of my greatest, like earliest, memories is I had a I want to know set of encyclopedias like junior you know kids encyclopedias Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. these were like you know illustrated kind of simple things and I remember I would just like sit and read these as like um you know a very I felt very like um studious, you know, and I, that goes all the way back to, you know, first grade. I, as I'm learning to read, I remember being very um, curious about these things. I remember at one point in maybe third grade or so, I was fascinated by uh, auto engines. You know, the, I found these big <clears throat> books that had uh, the drawings of the way engines mm-hmm. worked and stuff. And I remember like checking these books out of the library and like, you know, looking at all just the illustrations of the cutaways of how mm-hmm. combustion engines like uh, work, even though I'm not at all like mechanical inclined, but I just remember that was something that was, um, that was really interesting to me and uh, biographies. When I was young, there was a series of illustrated um, biographies of, you know, you think about how, um, I remember there was one about, uh, they were all about popular uh, people now, but Pele was one of them, uh, the great soccer player, and um, Elton John was one of them, but they were like, almost like, children's books you know because i was in second grade or whatever you know but they were um illustrated kids books that taught you about um about these people so i've always i've always been you know curious like that yeah well mine was different uh mine was historical and uh yeah but the same starting point i had the uh we had the uh, Britannica, um, you know, the actual adult Britannica. Yeah, we didn't get that. And, uh, I, and, and we also, we were about two miles away from one of the uh, Carnegie libraries, small town, but it had this beautiful library wow. with a reference room. And and, uh, and uh, so I remember, uh, you know, uh, you know, they'd go for shopping trips into the small town to pick up stuff. And, you know, there'd be an hour or so, and I would go coddle over at six and seven years old to the reference library. And, you know, they had all sorts of um, other encyclopedias, Collier's and Macmillan. And, you know, they had these, and I would check to see, but the Britannica was uh, clearly the, the more authoritative, um, authoritative one. But one of the things that really fascinated me was to read about uh, a historical period that, say, had happened. I was born in the 40s that had happened in the early part of the century and then actually um, meet someone who had been a child from that age and was, you know, 50 years, 40, 50 years older Uh than I was. And then I would ask them if they remembered the incident that I'd read about in the book. And I got this crossover between how things are written um, by people who weren't there, you know, in other words, these are historians who are looking back and they're collecting, um, you know, maybe newspaper articles or uh, reports at that time, and they're putting together a picture. And then you meet someone who was actually there during the times. And I just noticed this enormous difference between how people actually experience these things and how they were talked about in day-to-day life and those who, looking back from a distance, actually described. And there's this tremendous difference, uh, you know, that um, 
One is that when people are going through important things, they don't think that they're important. Oh, are you there? Yeah, here we are. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that when people are actually living through important, um, important times, they're not really aware that they're really important times. That's a Uh title that's put on a description and a title that's put on later. You know, this was really, it's like the sixties, you know, I went, I remember going through the sixties, you know, and yeah, uh, I mean, you know, uh, there was a lot going on, but you didn't have any sense that there was an enormous importance to any of this stuff. I I wonder, that is something like when you look uh, back on certain on times like I remember looking back that um, when the Berlin Wall came mm-hmm. down, you know, nineteen eighty nine or ninety, yep. I guess. Yeah, yeah. And November, I remember, November, you know, November. Yeah, 89, but that was a know. pretty. That was a pretty like it was on the news and it was mm-hmm. something that was that was happening. But I actually had uh, a couple of friends from college who um, who went over there and were there and experienced like now they've got this a piece of the berlin wall and the story of being there Mm -hmm. as the wall's coming down and i'm looking right now at what's happening in hong kong as all these protests are going on where we kind of have this sense of distance for things like we have a window on everything in terms of watching it unfold through Twitter and Instagram and social media and YouTube and all these things. It's not like it's happening, you know, like all we saw in 1989 was what we saw on the news or in magazines, right? There was no like sense of the real time thing of seeing protesters cut down these, uh, I don't know how in in touch you've been with what's going on over the last week, but the latest thing now is there's all the protesters, you know, cutting down all the facial recognition towers because they have uh, cameras that are, so everybody's there. Yeah. Everybody is. Well, they've already run into the problem. You know, (laughs) yeah. People are trying to leave by um, airline from Hong Kong Uh and they're going and they're being refused because their social credit score um, uh, prohibits them from actually traveling by air. Outside so meanwhile, the it's, it's dinging their social credit. Just by yeah, yeah. Being, watching yeah. them on and, video. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think that the Chinese government is really between a rock and a hard place here. And part uh-huh. of the reason is just the thing that you pointed to is that when they did this in Tiananmen Square, this was 1989 when they just mowed down. You know, we have numbers, one image. Yeah. Yeah. Numbers are between. Well, first of all, they don't you never really saw the massacres that actually went on. Right. And, you know, they estimated may have been anywhere between five and ten thousand people who were ultimately killed there. But first of all, it was way in the north because Beijing um, sits, you know, way, way north of uh, Hong Kong. Hong Kong's in the tropics. Uh, Beijing is you know, up just a little bit south of Korea, uh, Manchuria, Mongolia, you know, it's not, it's, it's a Northern city. And, uh, but the other thing is they didn't have witnesses that in 1989, the Chinese could control totally what got videoed and what didn't get videoed. Now with a population of, you know, two and a half million people, each who have a cell phone and they're talking to each other and they're sending images out and everything else, is that you can't pull that type of political, um, you know, that real hard-fisted uh, stomping down on protest. You can't do that right. today and get away with it the way you could from that, yeah, right. that 30 years ago. 30 years ago, yeah. 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 And uh, it's very, very interesting, The uh, and it's witnesses. You know, the big thing is, is yeah. you know, that uh, it's witnesses. And I was talking to someone, they said, um, about Toronto, the city of Toronto. And I said, you know, the most momentous thing happened in um, Toronto, probably, and you you'd, might remember uh, it, and it was the last mayor of the actual city of Toronto because uh, Toronto is now a, you know, it's a big 
amalgamated government now. The GTA is now an amalgamate. And, you, you know, you have, um, you know, Mayor Tory is now the mayor of a much bigger, bigger um, section of land than the mayor in, the, mm. I think it was in the 90s, Barbara Hall, I think her name was Barbara Barbara Hall. How far reaching is and it now? The, the yeah, and watch, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, you used to have a mayor of, uh, of Lee Side. You had a mayor of uh, North York. You had a mayor of Scarborough. You had a mayor, and you had all these. And well, that's all part of the city of Toronto now. That's all I gotcha. made it. Okay. But the thing about it was that I remember in her, and this is just the city of Toronto. So it's basically downtown Toronto. That was the city. And this mayor brought through a zoning law, which I think utterly changed the city of Toronto. And she said that any in any area, you can have mixed use. You can have residential, you can have retail, you can have uh, commercial, you can have corporate, you can have corporate. Then any building can have all four of those things. You could have a hotel, you could have condos, you could have stores, you could have a mall, and it can mm-hmm. all be contained. And that just utterly changed the city because what it meant is that you didn't have separate use sections of the city. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and probably the most resistant um, to that in downtown Toronto right now is Bay Street. I mean, if you think of Bay Street, the the financial district is still mainly corporate mainly corporate buildings and at nighttime it's kind of empty you know it's kind of dead yeah yeah but i'm noticing as time goes on that some of what used to be corporate office buildings have been turned into condos right in the Mm -hmm. downtown area so now you you have you know where before you had uh, fours and fours some corporations would have three or four fours on those same fours now you might have uh, 20 condo units you know, multiply by two, maybe, you know, you have 30, 40, 50, 60 people living there. And then there's restaurants down on the street because they have to eat somewhere. And then there's stores and everything else. And what it means is that at nighttime in downtown Toronto, there's just lots and lots of people around watching things. And the crime rate's very low because there's so many witnesses. I don't oh. know if you've noticed this, but, but thieves tend to plan their uh, activities in such a way that there in aren't your any absence. witnesses. Yes. In your absence, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's much more successful, yeah. You don't want a key primary <laughs> witness. Of the, you don't want the no, I mean, if you go to the basic, robbing the witness, yeah. No, I mean, if you go to the very basic uh, level one handbook for thieves, uh, you know, uh, it, it spells it out right there. You know, you're your best bet of having a successful future as a thief. That's why everybody's so with... shocked when they say it happened in broad daylight. <laughs> <laughs> all of your thievery, all the good thievery yeah. happens under cover of darkness. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm going back to is your, uh, you know, your discussion on the, the difference between Hong Kong in 1989 and the Berlin Wall, or the, the Berlin Wall in 1989 and Hong Kong and in uh, in uh, 2019, that the, there's just millions of witnesses. Where yeah. even that event was still ma- mainly a controlled, um, you know, the reporting on it was still controlled by large media organizations or by the government, you know, in uh, communist countries. And I think that yeah. it's just showing the difference. The Chinese that they're getting into the world that's not controlled by the Communist Party as much as it is in other areas of the country where they can control um, what goes on and they can control in here. If they bring the tanks in, you know, immediately all the, what makes Hong Kong a valuable city switches in about two weeks to Singapore. And, you know, there's a enormous flight capital and, uh, you know, Singapore is just sitting there waiting for the Chinese government to ruin Hong Kong because Singapore would then be the, main center. And again, it's Chinese. I mean, Singapore is mainly made up of Chinese people. So, so very, very interesting. I mean, that's a real thing, a difference of, you know, a relationship that you and I are experiencing, the shifting relationship between Cloudlandia and the mainland. Yes. 
as you know, when you've got your, um, you know, your lens, that's, that's what's really amazing is your lens into the mainland from Cloudlandia. Like you tap into mm -hmm. and you've got this portal that you can really be transported anywhere that we can witness. I mean, you can essentially, I'm sure there are people who are live streaming every uh you know lots of different perspectives of the oh uh, yeah of what's going on yeah yeah and they're giving you know i mean they're giving firsthand on the street reports that used to be mm -hmm. restricted to approved reporters or yes uh, you know or reporters taking a risk but here they're not really taking a risk because everybody's doing it you know i have two of my main artists um, husband and wife are from Hong Kong, and you know I, I chat with them, and they said, uh -huh. "Yeah, you know, I mean, they're, they're watching, and they've walked the streets where this is happening, and wow. you know, and uh, yeah, so it's a, it's an interesting perspective that the event. Well, I mean, that's just what, when uh, that was really when um, you know, think about CNN was kind of just oh yeah, the only game in town really for that twenty four hour news in the um you know in that period in the 90s when when the berlin wall was going on i just watched um dan i don't know if you're ever going to reinst reinstate your uh television um situation but i just watched a um series on the loudest voice in the room i think it was called which is the telling of the um roger ailes story mm -hmm. how they yeah. built fox news from the from the beginning and russell crow plays yes. roger ailes in it and literally disappears into the role through prosthetic oh, wow. makeup and i mean you would never he looks exactly like Roger Ailes, like just the the all the extra weight, full body, um, you know, padding prosthetics, yep. everything about him, and he did a stellar job. But it was an amazing, um, it was an amazing um, story too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the thing is now, and uh, of course, it was the uh, Murdoch family. I think that owns. Uh, Fox, really, isn't it? Yes, uh, that's right. Murdoch. Yep, that's exactly Murdoch right. And, Mur uh, and Elder Murdoch, you know, I don't know if he is he dead, dead now. Uh, no, Rupert, he's, still, Rupert. he's still kicking. Yeah, he's a 90 ish or something like that. And yeah. anyway, but he was a real hard nosed, you know, entrepreneur, but his children are very squishy, you know, and his children mm. now run Fox. And I'm noticing the squishy in the sense that, uh, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, um, you know, he basically was, you know, uh, he hewed, you know, his whole career and Fox came very late in his career. He was big, um, you know, big media guy in Britain, yeah. Australian originally, Australian originally, and then went to the UK and, um, and I think he created sort of like independent television against the BBC and uh, in uh, England and everything like that, you know. But the thing is that the case, they themselves are now being surpassed by the Internet channels like uh, yeah, the real story. Uh, the real story on the Internet is really Breitbart. Breitbart I don't know mm -hmm. if you Breitbart is like what uh, Fox was, you know, um, 20 years ago um, and yeah. Breitbart is the independent voice and they've got such a hold that they can't be shut down by Google uh, or any, you know, Google would love to shut down Breitbart, but they can't, you know, because there's, there's just, it's just got too big of an audience. So I think that as Fox has lost its political identity, which was basically certainly right of center, um, um, I think people have switched over to, first of all, to a, a different source, but the source isn't another cable channel. It's actually an internet, uh, an internet platform. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's really where you can get, you know, exactly the flavor or, um, you know, whatever you're, whatever you're looking for. 
But you realize too that there's no, um, you know, the internet that has really opened up the whole opportunity for you to be Breitbart. You know, there's no, yeah. there's nothing stopping you from, um, you know, picking your lane. I mean, every category has examples of that. There's a big, um, uh, there's a big company called uh, Barstool Media where they have, they've taken over kind of the sports um, world of that. They're like an independent sports, uh, you know, mm -hmm. network with both podcasts and video, it's all the, the content of building an audience like that. So whatever your lens is, it's part of this thing, Dan, of coming into um, Cloudlandia, your citizenship in Cloudlandia gives you a radio station, a, uh, you know, a free press yeah. and, uh, and a television station and free distribution of, of, you know, free mail, basically with email to be able to reach them and a one-to-one -one connection to 5 billion people. Yeah. And, you know, we're into our fourth year now with, um, you know, with uh, um, the joy of procrastination. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really flown by, but we're into it because it was July of um, July of 2016. Is it really four um, years, Dan? No, we're into our fourth year. So you oh, I see what you're saying. Our, yeah. So next yeah, year we're we'll into be, our fourth. I see. Okay. Yeah. So three yeah. and a bit. Right. Yeah. Now. We're into right, our right, fourth right, year. Right. But but think about the, uh, you know, the the speed with which it started. You know, it started yeah. at a conversation on a Saturday over lunch, yeah. and by Sunday, virtually 24 hours later, uh, it was a a podcast reality. I, I want, you know, I think when we look back at this particular moment in time right now, if we take a, a snapshot of 2019 as we're heading into, you know, we're just about to head into 2020. And mm -hmm. I think as we enter into the 20s right now, I think like there's never been a... Uh, you know, a more important or, you know, uh, you can't even find the right words for it, monumental, like, set of circumstances that we find ourselves in right now with the fully matured internet as it is, mm -hmm. right? Like, we're, we've everybody, mm -hmm. there's more smartphones than people. There's more mm -hmm. uh, bandwidth than we need. There's, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, 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 every single person you literally, and there's nothing stopping anybody from being, um, from being bright, Bart. There's nothing stopping. No. Well, you know what? One of the things I did well, want to. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I mean, the one thing uh, um, I've created with my podcast manager, Gord Vickman, we've created a, one called Podcast Power because we're getting lots and lots of inquiries from strategic coach clients, you know, because they, uh -huh. you know, they, they listen to our podcast and they say, well, yes. how, how do you, how do you actually get started with that? And I said, well, first of all, um, you've got to have, you got to feel you have something to say. I said, number one, and number two is that you have to have an audience that, you know, that will probably engage with what you're talking mm -hmm. about. And, uh, and I said, and then you learn as you go that, uh, you know, you get feedback continually. People are feeding back to you and say, boy, I really like that. Hey, could you talk about this and that? So you're in a relationship and my audience tends to be show up once a quarter and they give me reports. Yes. And, uh, yes. and, uh, and the thing is that, um, I want to bring up a topic here because, in, there's a word which I think no longer applies to any kind of reality that I uh, experienced, but I, I had this reality when I was growing up, but there is no reality. It was called systems. Systems. Okay, I'll give you an example. Um, there's the, um, um, uh, the educational system. I grew up in an educational system. Okay, and mm -hmm. I grew up in a... Um, uh, sort of a hospital system, and I grew up in um, 
um, um, uh, a newspaper, a national newspaper system, a national radio uh-huh. system, a national television system, and yeah. everything else. And so um, we look at today, and everything seems confusing because things aren't organized into systems like they were at an earlier time in our life. Okay. And they kind of crave this, you know, well, where's the system here? Who, who's in charge? And I said, yeah, well, that's kind of the point. Uh, there isn't anybody actually in charge, you know, and I think that it's the cause of a tremendous amount of anxiety right now, the feeling that, well, uh, you're in charge. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. And, uh, I mean, we're in charge. Basically, we had an idea. And you had the means to immediately trigger it because you had already created the, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the Internet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, tell everybody again how they can get to this because I think it's useful because a lot of people really don't know how they can start a podcast just by um, going yeah, so to we your platform. Now we just have – it's just – arrive in the um, app store now a um, we have a, a service called dial talk and that dial whole, talk dial talk done yeah and that's dial talk break. done because that's really the uh, and we have an app now for solo uh, podcasts so there's really three ways like i think podcasting is going to be you know an amazing um thing because you're keeping and building a uh a living thing an asset yeah. i think there's yeah. a lot of value in that content i just saw um i don't know if you've seen the news right now but the um seinfeld um the contract for the digital rights to distribute replays of Seinfeld online was with Hulu and Hulu, the contract with Hulu is up at the end of 2019 and the estimates of the uh, bids to have those rights going forward for the next five years are at $500 million. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, maybe Netflix or Amazon or somebody's going to have that, <laughs> those rights for a show that well, they built, uh, you know, content that they built and recorded, captured for um, nine years, you know, 180 episodes or 200 episodes. Yeah. Uh, they yeah. did total. And it's been worth, uh, you know, billions of of dollars. Well, the, the interesting thing about it is that they're kind of timeless because they yes. uh, they were designed they were designed not to have any meaning. Right. No, not about anything. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And I, love, I mean it was you know, 9 years at, it was nine <laughs> That's a new definition of timeless so that at yeah. the time it has no meaning in the moment. You know, there's no meaning right. in the moment. <laughs> so right. I, I mean yeah, I mean it's uh, it's amazing stuff, and uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of funny because uh, Jerry uh, Seinfeld himself seems to be almost the person least impressed by what the accomplishment was. I think you're right. Yeah, absolutely. He can't I mean, everybody else believe it. Tried, so. uh, everybody else has tried to hook their career to it, and uh, maybe yeah. With, Julia Dreyfus, I think she's probably been the most successful, but everybody else, nobody else really got a big career bump out of it once they were finished with. That yeah. Point. And little known fact, I didn't realize it, but uh, Julia's uh, father is a billionaire. Oh, the Dreyfus family. I mean, the Dreyfus, yeah. the Dreyfus, Dreyfus funds. I mean, they've been giants for 100 years in New York, the Dreyfus Dreyfus funds so and I in Europe before that I think yeah Europe is that's where it first started yeah for grandfather or whatever I guess but anyway that yeah. um, neither uh, here nor there but people starting a a podcast um, that you you know it lives and you have this um, 
thing where you're joining a conversation or would be anybody in the future can join a conversation and catch up very quickly into it allows you to condense the amount of time that it takes for somebody to know that they're one of you, that you're one of them, that they're yeah. in your You know something, uh, uh, tribe. Can I t- yeah, can I tell you where I think that uh, I certainly had this at a much younger age and experience um, with this, and I don't know if it, uh, it came over, you know, to your particular generation, but it was the Little Rascals. Uh, yeah, I remember the Little Rascals, yeah. So the Little Rascals were done as soon as you had sound uh, sound movies in the, yeah. well, it was ba- basically the late 30s and through the 40s was the little, um, and but um, they, they got replayed on t- when television came in because these were yeah. Ser- movie serials that were done on Saturday afternoon. She went to the local movie movie house and there right. were 15 minutes to a half hour um, episodes of the little rascals. Yeah. And, uh, and so um, I remember when they came on, it was so exciting. And this would be in the fifties when they got the rights to these, to replay them. So I think that's uh-huh. sort of a, a similar situation of going from the where movies were something that you went to a place on Saturday and you watched them and then you had this thing where you could just watch them on TV. I mean, still at a restricted hour, a timed hour. And then now uh, you had uh, Seinfeld, which occurred at a particular hour, you know, on cable TV or certainly network TV. And then now it's available whenever you want to watch it on the internet. Yeah. You know? So it's interesting, yeah. but th- I, you could, just, I remember us of, talk, I, mean, I, I remember talking about the characters and, you yeah. know, you were talking about them like they were eight or nine years old, but by that time they were in their twenties and thirties, you know, the actual <laughs> actors, the actual, the actual actors. Yeah. But I remember, uh, you know, it was funny, like of all the things to talk about is of the little rascals to come up. I don't know whether it was I was recording a podcast or whether I was just talking with somebody about looking back like you know, we're talking about, um, you know, in the 70s, like what was happening in 1976. We're talking about some TV show that was on there, which is like 40 years ago yeah. now right 43 yeah 40 yeah years and i'm now. thinking i think we were talking about like looking back we're like we're looking back on it now with fondness on whatever it was we were talking about in the 70s 1976 or um 1980 i guess in that range and then looking backwards the same amount of time like if we were there looking back from 1980 backwards or 1970s mm-hmm. uh you know that 76 to uh 79 mm-hmm. backwards that would have put you smack in the middle of the 30s within the yeah. little rascals time that's what we were the little talking rascals about time, it's yeah. like yeah <laughs> i mean it's just and but they're captured for well forever yeah well here's the thing that a conversation about seinfeld today you know uh, not, yeah, and that that that's really not part of my experience. You know, I went and yeah. I checked it out and everything else, but uh, I mean, it really wasn't part of my experience going right. through the Seinfeld series. But I would say that conversations about Seinfeld among people now who are seeing the whole series, um, yeah. you know, are going through it again is much more meaningful than conversations were about Seinfeld when it was actually. Yeah, happening. the kids now who are watching it, like college kids now who are binging and catching up or watching Seinfeld on reruns. These are all things that were happening before they were even born. Like simply yeah. for me, same with Gilligan's Island and same with uh, yeah. Andy Griffith, you know, those kind of things. And all that to say that recording these things, the conversation that Joe Polish and I had when we first started, I love marketing was, to document the conversations that we were having and to think about a hundred years from now, like, you know, and I say that 
not to compare ourselves to Claude Hopkins and or Albert Lasker or the great advertising people in the the you know teens and twenties, but to say you know imagine a hundred years from now that somebody uncovers these conversations between contemporary marketers in the you know the two thousands here. And, you know, they've now gone you. into 2100. It's exactly, you start to think now that that's how fascinated we would be right now yeah. if Albert Lasker and Claude Hopkins had gotten together and recorded a podcast every week about what they were doing and what was working yeah. and what was going on. That would have been like, we. I would just like, consume every minute of that you know yeah 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 i mean the the really smart people uh you know are smart relative to the time that they're you know that things are taking place i've been playing with this concept of um, advantage and uh i was at a party here at an island country last last night and uh, you know it got into you know well you know that fossil fuels days are numbered and mm. i said well uh i said well that's been true for my entire life you know that fossil fuels days that's have true. been numbered and i said but here's here's the thing about it we and they said well it's very very clearly that the earth would be better off if we were totally on solar power and i said well Probably solar power has an absolute advantage over fossil fuels, but during any next 90 days, fossil fuels always has a relative advantage over solar, solar, uh, you know, over solar energy. In other words, mm. uh, would you willingly, over the next 90 days, stop your dependence 100% on fossil fuels and switch over to solar for the next 90 days? In other words, everything you did. You're going to say, well, I know it's got the absolute advantage, so I'm going to switch over right now. And they said, well, wait, mm. wait a minute, wait a minute, we got to get around, you know, we get things after the things. And the, the thing is that the amount of in, ingenuity and new technology going into the capture of fossil fuels is actually greater than the amount of ingenuity and investment going into solar. So. The thing that I'm seeing here, and this is for another discussion, but I think it's very, mm -hmm. very important as it relates to our procrastination. I think we procrastinate because we feel that if we just wait for the absolute solution to come along, it'll be better than the relative solution that we might be contemplating doing today or tomorrow, and therefore we procrastinate. But the fact is the absolute never comes. All we get is uh, choice that we have to make, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of like, uh, would you switch over to electric cars? So Babs has an electric car, you know, yes. and I say He's on my way, cars. I'm waiting. I, uh... And you, and you have one and you have one and people say, well, everybody should switch over to them. And I said, yeah, but, uh, uh, it wouldn't make sense for everybody to do it because the relative advantage of the electric car for them, they they don't have a garage where they have a charger. They, you know, they uh, they 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 live someplace where they don't have a charger. Whereas there's a gas station around the corner. You know, they can yeah. they go around and get gas. So anyway, I'm just playing with an idea here and uh, to talk to you about it that. Reality is the mainland reality is really based on relative advantage. It's not based on absolute advantage. Cloudlandia dreams about absolute advantage, you know, when things like this can happen just like this. But in fact, we live our lives by making choices on relative advantage, not absolute advantage. Does that make sense? I don't know if um, it, no, it really does. I mean, and people, um, I think what you've hit on to in the flavor of procrastination there is people waiting for the absolute advantage or the absolute um, solution? I, a, well, no, I know it's a really interesting thing, the anticipation of something declining or the anticipation of something. So I, I look at a couple of different um, 
versions of this. So I, um, I can ex- say I experienced a form of procrastination that on retro, uh, on, on review here, has was costly to the tune of probably millions of dollars in that I, when I met Homer McDonald in, in 1998, mm-hmm. the gentleman mm-hmm. that I wrote, uh, stop your divorce, the divorce, the divorce yeah. book. Yeah. Yes. Homer McDonald was 76 years old when I met him and he was a different 76 than you're going to be in, in less than a year here. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I, in the back of my mind, something as I was kind of thinking about this was thinking, I, I don't know, you know, whether I want to like invest in a, like go full on into something here that with someone who's 76 years old. Now, you know, keep in mind, I was a younger you know, I was 32 years old at the time, right? So even mm-hmm. my perspective on time and stuff has has sure. changed. I was really only, you know, less than 10 years into my, what I'll call my adult, you know, entrepreneurial life kind of thing. And I kept, you know, delaying or not 100% committing. I would say I was like one foot... Uh, I was only like partially committed to this for a uh, period of time. I didn't put it, I didn't do everything that I could have um, done because I wasn't thinking that there would be the long term um, of Mm -hmm. this. And now, you know, Mm -hmm. fast forward, he, he lived to, he just passed away a couple of um, years ago, but he lived to be 93, 94 years old, (laughs) full you know, and 100% like in, uh, you know, top, you know, condition, do, still doing telephone counseling every day all the way um, through into his 90s. And if I look back on that now, it would have been a different scenario. I would have done have more. Um, so I find myself now in that same, I'm looking back on this thing now and I see in my, I see this sort of paralysis happening among my real estate community, among the the people Mm -hmm. in my real estate world in that there's all this talk of disruption and I buyers and, um, you know, things happening in the marketplace and everybody's sort of, sounding the death knell for the real estate industry as a whole. And I see that and I start to think like, what would be, is that true? First of all, like, I think when you look at, we kind of under, I don't know what the right word is here. We kind of overestimate how quickly the future is going to get here. And yeah, you know, underestimate the amount of time, the durability, the durability left. of the present. Well, the durability yeah. of the present too. That's a good way to put it. The durability of the yeah. present. Yeah, the, dur- uh, the durability. Well, I mean, the present still has some muscles. It still has some. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. What do you, What's your yeah. take on? What's your take on that? Because I know that you've had. Oh no, I, I believe it's with true. Peter Diamandis too, right? Yeah. Well, I was thinking of uh, the Bill Gates story. So Bill Gates, who's from Seattle and had money because his dad had money. Nevertheless, when he first started what became Microsoft, he did it in Texas. I think it was in Austin, Texas. And he had a uh, just a an, an industrial building and sort of, you know, like those sort of you see in on the outside. Are you talking about Michael town. Dell? Are you talking about Michael Dell? Or? No, I'm talking about Bill Gates. I'm talking about Bill Gates. This is Microsoft. Bill Gates so micro, micro, started in Seattle. Okay. Yeah, but actually, when they really first got started, he was actually in Texas. He had uh, I didn't know that. his operations. Okay. To, and uh, they were short, um, you know, on cash flow one month. And he went to the 
owner of the building, and he said, look, he said, uh, I'm just going to offer you this right now because we're just getting started here. And he said, I just wondered, instead of paying you rent, you'd just take a percentage of the company. And the guy said, oh, boy. oh no. He says, oh, no. He says, I've seen you guys before. He said, uh, no, no, no. He says, cash up front. I want the cash up front, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't care if it was a half of 1% or uh, a hundredth of 1% of Microsoft, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he would have probably done better. I mean, saying, well, I won't do this with any of my other clients, but I'll do it with this one. Just uh, just, just to hedge my bets, I'm going to do this with one of them just to see if it, you know, actually works out, you know. And, um, yeah, so this was a this is a Microsoft story. This isn't uh, this isn't Mike. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And what's he would take on. What, what's your take on that? On the. Yeah. Sort well, of I think so. Of, yeah. Well, I think so, too. And I think the thing is that um, uh, you're listening to a general narrative. You're not paying attention to a specific narrative. In other words. Yeah. 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 But if I disregard what the general narrative is, is there people I know who want to buy real estate during the next uh, year and yeah. would be really interested in somebody helping them out with this? And are there people who I know who would want to sell real estate? And yeah. um, and would that be probably as, if I really thought about it and put down names, you know, buyer column, seller column, where I can be useful and connect people in that, would that amount of activity kind of match what was true for the last 12 months? In other words, the 12 months going forward, does it look like the amount of activity is pretty much the same as the activity? And yeah, say, so good. Well, why don't we just do this next 12 months and then make a decision on where the industry is going? So that's just choosing the specific and the relative over the general and the absolute. And I think that everybody who does well in life ignores the general and the absolute and just focuses on what's available. Yes. Oh, that's brilliant. That's so, uh, you know, I'm doing our, um, the real estate event that um, I did last fall where you and I recorded a, a live yeah. episode mm-hmm. again yeah. this year. And the focus this year is going to be on the future of real estate yep. and that's mm-hmm. a valuable perspective right there. That's exactly, um, well, you know, it's still, I mean, um, you know, I remember, uh, there was a recent president of the United States, um, the, the one before Trump, remember that one? Uh, yes, Trump? exactly. I yeah. do. And that, uh, there, I remember some comments about, uh, that he made while he was president. One of them is that, you know, when is enough income enough income? And he mm. says, when, it, when do you have enough income? When do you, when do you have enough wealth? You know, and he was mm-hmm. trying to shame people who have this as a goal. And right. he said, you know, one of the things we have to worry about now is the rising sea levels. So he said, yeah. <laughs> you know, and he says, why are people still buying massive, expensive, pieces of real estate where clearly on coastal areas, the seas are going to reclaim that. He said, this is a, you know, this is a worldwide problem. And yet the news yesterday is Michelle and Barack Obama (laughs) just bought a $15 million mansion, a mansion in Cape Cod, which is coastal, which is coastal. (laughs) And it turns out that the former president and his wife who went into the white house and, 2008, uh, not having very much net worth at all, now have $135 million of net worth. So, yeah. And, um, and I said, well, just shows you if you just pay attention to deals that are possible over, uh, you know, over a <laughs> 11 year period, I think, uh, no matter what the, uh, the people say is generally going to happen and, you know, the seas are going to rise and everything like that. And I said, he must know something about, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're investing 15 million on a piece of property and I've seen the property, I mean, it's, yeah, you know, the house, the house is about, you know, it's a football field or even less from the sea. And yeah, you know, that's the Atlantic. That's the Atlantic. Yeah. So that's one of the big seas. <laughs> there you go. It just tells that's you. Funny. 
that there's still there's still action in the real estate market. I like the word durability of the present. That's the word. The durability of the present. Yeah. The durability of the present, and I think that that's. I think that's true when you look at the near term, like the three year window here. That the durability yeah. is probably quite secure for the next three years. That there's nothing going to completely blindside us in the next three years. Um, yeah. As you know who's the, the master of this? Stuff. You know the master of this is really Warren Buffett. I mean, if you, yeah. uh, you know, his uh, newest company that he's investing in right now, in other words, the company that has been around the least amount of time is 43 years. What's that? That's Apple. I mean, he invested in oh, Apple. Oh, yeah, right. About, exactly. Yeah, about, yeah. Two year, about two years ago, he said, you know, uh-huh. I kind of get a handle after 40 years what these guys are really about. And he says, I think they're uh-huh. worth investing in. <laughs> investing yeah. In. But, you know, I mean, you look at his entire portfolio, you know, of things. Uh, I think he just has a feel of stuff that's just going to stick around forever. You know, yes, like, uh, I agree. I, I got a feeling every day, depending regardless of what's happening in the world, um, uh, people are probably going to, somewhere, are going to want to coke. They're going to have, you know, it could be, a, could be a cherry coke like me. And he says, and I buy it by the box. He says, you know, I buy, oh, I buy it by the curtain. <laughs> I love how he said that. People are still men are going to wake up. Yep, they're going to wake up he, with whiskers. And yep, King Gillette right. is going to be there to help them. Just like Although, did you see the, Did you see the? Did you see the whack that Gillette took over the last year? I did not. Yeah, so they, you know, they went uh, to with the Me Too movement, and that uh, the, that they went against men being masculine over the last. So they've been out there twelve months, and they have lost four point six billion dollars. Wow! In sales. I didn't realize. Wow! Yeah, and, and you know who's picked them up is. Sh- Chick and uh, Harry's, you know, the Harry's, the uh-huh. online yep. razor thing. Harry's, yep. um, Harry's doesn't, doesn't really care if you're a manly man or what, if, as long as you buy the razor. They, they, don't, they don't really care what your ideological beliefs are. I think when right. corporations start delving into political and cultural and social issues, um, I think there's well, on the line, their their stockholders are not going to be happy with their decision to get involved in that. Agreed. Agreed. Just sell stuff. Just sell stuff. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. Well, there we go. So this is, uh, boy, we covered, uh, I have to tell you, we really covered, you and I really covered the neighborhood on this <laughs> we one. We really did. We really did. It's because we're rested. But I think, and, uh, uh, I think reflective. you're, uh, yeah, I think this, um, uh, relative and absolute and uh, the durability of the present with the, you know, the, um, the overestimation on how fast the future is going to arrive. I think that's, yeah. Cause I think that paralyzes people and I, uh, yes, nothing else. I'm uh, recognizing that it has, paralyzed, it has paralyzed me in the past. And yes. if I do a experience transformer, on it, looking back, that I would have taken mm-hmm. a different course of action had I known. And I find myself surrounded by and in the midst of people who are um, with the same reluctance of saying, mm-hmm. I don't know whether I want to go all in in the real estate world because I don't know how long it's going to last in this current thing. But I think. Like you're yeah. saying, and I've been thinking, if I go, if if you encourage people to think in terms of what is durable, you hit, you hit the nail on the head with, do I know people who want to buy and sell homes? And I think if you look at what's not going to change is the shelter business is not going to go out of style, right? We're going to be, yeah. we're going to want to live in all houses and people are going to want to move those houses and something's got well and i think that you know i mean uh, um status competition operates in all uh, (laughs) on all days you know status competition uh people um and you know i mean it's not that homes don't have many other dimensions to them but they certainly have 
you know, that movement upwards in the yes. real estate market is certainly a very, very uh, tangible form of status competition. You know, and yes. um, what, um, is there an end to that? I mean, a year from now, are people not going to compete on the basis mm. of status? Mm. Not at don't all. Think so. I don't either. Yeah. All right, Dan. Oh, this was a delight. delight for you. It was a delight. It always it was is a, a delight. delight. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, lots of uh, new themes to pick up, and I'll pick up on some of the thoughts about um, 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 having t- tomorrow happen today. You know, uh, making I like tomorrow. It. I really today. want to talk about yeah. that too. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, I've given more thought to it, but you had some real interesting stuff. The Seinfeld little rascal comparison is a tremendously interesting one. Yes. I and I'll so tell too. you, I'll tell everybody about my three days with Doreen, one of the original Mouseketeers on one of our official ones. I spent three days with Doreen. Oh, yes, Tracy. I remember. I, I remember. Went, yeah, yeah. yeah Doreen here. Tracy. Went, yeah, and she just died last year. She died of cancer last year. Oh, so. yeah. Uh, and, uh, anyway, uh, but, uh, it was really interesting because the mouse, the original Mouseketeers was, uh, epic, epic history. It really was. Event. Yeah. Yeah. And of course you're very near the, you know, the kingdom. I am. You're very close I am. to the kingdom there. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, but I had three days to talk to her about what it was like to be one of the original Mouseketeers and, uh, very, very interesting, very solid uh, you know, I mean, uh, the more I think about it, looking back, the who she was and how she presented herself and then what became of her you know, over a long lifetime actually really struck me as um, really someone who was really level headed and simply took advantage of opportunities. And um, yeah, so really great stuff. Have a great day, Dean. Next time. Bye. Bye.